Yeah, I've done a lot of writing and a lot of interviews on critical infrastructure, and I, I think there is a huge concern. Why? Just look at critical infrastructure as a whole. Most of the systems, unfortunately, especially throughout the U.S., are still built upon the backbone of old legacy systems. They have not been upgraded. Um, they're kind of segmented. There's no consistency throughout. Um, and, and sometimes that's actually good from a security standpoint, but sometimes that hurts you when it comes to trying to upgrade things. So it, it's kind of a, a little bit of a cat and mouse game, I think, with critical infrastructure, especially when you have uh, not just hackers going after it, but now you have nation states and sponsored attacks where there's a lot of hackers, a lot of cyber criminals, and there's a lot of funding behind it, which means you've got buildings with cyber criminals sitting there all day just trying to find that one vulnerability. Uh, it, it, it's hard to protect the entire system and get it right every time. It's easy to find that one vulnerability and somebody keeps chipping away until they can get into that back door or that vulnerability. And that's why the job becomes so mammoth. If you require just or rely just on the federal government to keep it secure, we're probably going to be in big trouble. They've got their hands filled. It's very expensive. They don't have the talent. So it has to be looked after third parties and, and private companies that can work private and public sector together and share information, share vulnerabilities, share different threat detection, and, and work together to fight off the cyber criminals. And I uh, I would say that that's probably one of the scariest things for the next decade is ensuring that we have uh, great security within our industrial systems, manufacturing and uh, infrastructure that we depend on as a society um, to give us things like water and power. Um, I think that training and focusing on those skills within schools now will set us up for filling those jobs in the future, but there's absolutely a great need for people who specialize in uh, those types of things. You know, it's interesting. I, I was having a conversation with someone in the last day uh, about uh, sort of the history of breaches, as, as it were. Um, I've spent a lot of years in the payment card industry, the PCI space, and in the early days of PCI, why PCI came about 16 years ago was because uh, bad guys had figured out how to make money by stealing credit card information and they made a lot of it and they stole a lot of credit card information and I was wondering uh, as we were talking about this sort of the history and the evolution of, of and really the positive impact that PCI has made on the fact that there's uh, uh, more companies that are doing more to protect credit card data but in, in, in effect a lot of that protection comes from a lot of these companies have figured out they don't need to store the credit card information, the transaction information for 10 years and have it be literally everywhere within their organization. Um, so the, the attack, the, the attack foot, footprint has been reduced. Uh, the, the opportunity to steal that data in some ways has been reduced. And I wonder if that has been a reason why the bad guys that are hoping to make money and monetize, uh, which is still largely the motivation for bad guys to, to break into things, uh, they've moved on to something else like ransomware, and they've moved on to crippling or impacting you know, uh, IoT systems, critical infrastructure systems. Um, even in the early days, we talked about the motivations of the bad guys, the attackers who I'm classically trained, that's what a threat is, is the people. Um, in the early days, we talked about what, what are their motivations. You know, monetization, making money, stealing was one thing, committing fraud. Uh, but there was, all, there was also political motivations, you know, trying to make a statement, uh, political activism, uh, trying to uh, go after companies that they perceived were doing things irresponsibly in terms of, you know, whatever, the environment, the economy, the, you know, whatever, the, whatever their beef was. Um, I think far and away, most of what we see these days in terms of breaches is still sort of on the monetary aspect. You know, it's financially motivated. People have figured out how to make money. That doesn't mean there's other reasons don't exist. Um, but it, it also goes back to that FUD thing we're talking about because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it can't happen. And critical infrastructure, the, the fact that uh, you know, power grids and could be taken down, terrorist activities could be uh, perpetrated against these types of things, um, 
certainly the the attempts are out there. They're, they're, that's where a lot of the attention is. In, in some way, I think about that's sort of the real mission of cybersecurity is sort of those clear and present danger things from a national security perspective. And then there's sort of the commercial world that also plays in it, but they're more interested in stopping fraud and stopping financial loss. Um, so the state of things are nothing's changed. Uh, the motivations perhaps have shifted gears a little bit. We, we're, we get good in one area and, and, and reduce breaches, but that means another area comes forward. Uh, I think the majority of the bad guys are still financially motivated, but that doesn't mean that they're not being paid by a terrorist group to go disrupt things or paid by a nation state to go disrupt things. There is no good answer to that question. Yeah. Uh, we need to understand things so much better because of IoT, because of nation state adversaries. There's, we don't know what we don't know, and there's so much we have to learn. This is a specialized area. We can't apply the same treatments and fixes and safeguards that we are used to using to secure this. And right now, everything is moving up into the cloud. Again, it's another area that we think we're prepared to deal with, but there really is so much more that we don't know. And those gaps are what the adversaries are taking full advantage of and ready to move into. I think we have some really big challenges ahead, and I would love to see us keep getting more people in with diverse backgrounds because we need to look at these problems with wider lenses, new tactics, new approaches. I think the main focus is the fact that we are bringing things in from the um, Internet of Things that uh, are connecting in an, in an environment that was never meant to be connected. So we've gone from what were once some, um, they were segregated, off the grid, and now we've expanded it. We have things that are speaking out, connecting to the network, we're bolting on connections on things that were not designed, we don't have safeguards or security in place to effectively take care of that. And the industrial security systems are so specialized and many of them are run until they fail because they're temperamental. It's very proprietary. You can't fix or touch or do things to them at risk of shutting down an entire plant or a maintenance system or things that are mission critical. Yeah, so it's, um, <clears throat> yeah, and IoT in, in general, whether you're talking industrial or not, you know, generally uh, that's a, the same issue we're seeing there is, um, uh, you know, people jumping into that space that uh, aren't necessarily familiar with security, you know, or the ramifications of putting something on a network or on the internet. Um, with industrial IoT, you have companies that uh, traditionally, uh, you know, their skills are in building this industrial equipment, not securing it. You know, not not understanding networks and the internet, and uh, um, you know how how wild and dangerous it can be to <laughs> to have something facing the public internet. Um, and they, they learn that very quickly, you know, typically. But um, uh, but generally, you know, the the issue in any market is the the rush to be competitors. You know, and it's very tough to say. No, let's slow down and think about this. You know, so they, and that's generally a business issue, but uh, more so in uh, industrial area where you know once you put a product together, you know you don't plan on changing it for a very long time. You know, they're very long lived. You know, here here we are with smartphones. Uh, you know, smartphone vendors are coming out with new models every six months. Um, you know, some of these uh, uh, consumer IoT devices are, are refreshed uh, multiple times a year. You know, so you have many changes to make uh, to update the product, to fix things, to improve things. Um, you know, so we, we do need to slow down a little bit and put some more thought into something with a 20 or 30 year lifespan. Or at least make sure we can update it easily <laughs> so we can, uh, we can fix things uh, while it's in use, while it's in production.